I'm Dawn Bershader, and I'd like to introduce you to my paperweight collection. In the last 70 years, paperweights have come out of obscurity into an era of great interest and popularity. Paperweight collecting occurs mostly in the United States, increasing tremendously in the last 20 years. Collecting often begins with a fascination. Who made these? How are they made? What's their value? What is inside and how was the outer design created? Just like anything else, the value of a piece depends on design, workmanship, condition, and rarity. Prices of old weights range from a few hundred to several thousand dollars. In 1990, a dealer paid $258,500 for a $25 19th century French paperweight at Sotheby's. In the 1970s, during a trip to San Francisco, I visited Gump's department store, fell in love with, and on impulse bought this gorgeous iridescent vase and this accompanying paperweight. And we'll talk a little bit more about the paperweights later, but I just fell in love with that almost Tiffany design. That started my paperweight purchases. But wait, I'm getting ahead of myself. There's so much to tell about paperweights. I'll just have to hit the highlights, starting with a bit of history of making glass millefiori in particular. Then we'll move to more modern times and learn of some glass techniques employed in making paperweights. Millefiori is most commonly associated with paperweights. It means a thousand flowers, which is the visual effect created by many different colors or patterns of canes coming together in a sort of collage. Millefiori existed over 5,000 5, years ago, but after the fall of the Roman Empire, the craft was lost for a thousand years. In the 1800s, Venice brought it alive again. It takes many tedious steps to create one millefiori glass cane. Single colored glass rods, thin rods, are repeatedly melted together when the design then is achieved. This bundle, which is probably about six inches around, is reheated and two glass workers grab each end of the bundle and quickly move apart, stretching it to 30 feet long. It cools very quickly and is laid on the floor and immediately cut into short pieces. This bundle of millefiori canes gives you an inkling of the variations that exist. With this magnifying glass, you can see the complexity of the canes. Here is what they look like. And this is one millefiori cane with a flower inside. Now that was created when the bundle was large, but when the thing was stretched out, the, the flower design still remains. Now, let's discuss why did paper baits come about. Paper arrived in Italy from Asia through Egypt and North Africa, then spread throughout Europe. The European postal system developed and regular exchange of letters was possible. A breeze or a draft could ruin a finely organized stack of papers. Voila! Paperweights are compact and heavy enough to hold down the paper. In 1843, a Venetian first made millefiori paperweights, limited in variety and color of rods. They were considered haphazard and crude in comparison with other contemporary work. The glorious classic period of paperweight making began in 1845 when France was the indisputable center of the world. 
and reached its height by 1860, so only a 15 year period, when Baccarat, San Luis, and Clichy, the ultimate glass houses, took paperweight art to its highest level and created some of the most remarkable paperweights ever produced. The three French producers probably produced no more than 25,000 weights between 1846 and 1860 when the period ended. To make a paperweight with millefiori, slices that we talked about, the rods are laying now on the floor and they've sliced them, those are painstakingly placed in the desired pattern in a metal template with collar. This arrangement is then heated to just below the glass melting point of 2600 degrees Fahrenheit. Then a small ball of red hot molten glass on the end of an iron rod is lowered onto the collar to pick up that preheated design. You can imagine how easily something could go wrong. A millefiori could slip out of place when the hot glass lands on it. But if all is well, the whole piece is then reheated in the oven and another gather of clean molten glass is then added and shaped to form the dome. This is an extremely delicate process as the weight can shatter and crack at any point. Many paperweights are made with the tiny millefiori clumped together. I've resisted that kind as I prefer a more complex arrangement of various types of millefiori. Okay, so now you know all about millefiori paperweights. Millefiori has been and still is found in paperweights as you will see in some of my modern weights. After 1860, the art of paperweight making all but disappeared for 80 years. Yay for modern times and modern weights. Here is how several different countries have contributed. First of all, China. As a child, I lived with a tiny paperweight that probably subconsciously attracted me to paperweights. Our family had this one fish and that world in there created a lot of intrigue and curiosity. It's a sulfide fish. This is terribly scratched. This is a better one with a frog in it or a toad. They're small, flat, poorly designed with poor quality glass and were to be used at the bottom of a little aquarium. These are collectible. They're about $90 a piece. This is a type of weight that China first produced in the 1930s when American businessmen took old French paperweights to Chinese glassworks to have them copied as genuine fake paperweights. Italy, compared to its work in the 1800s, produces better millefiori nowadays. I'm sure, sure you've seen their millefiori in inexpensive gifts and souvenirs. I'm afraid this next weight may be from Murano or worse yet, China. It was not the millefiori it was cracked up to be on eBay. But a positive on this weight is that I can show the overlay process. When the somewhat cooled weight is rolled around in white glass powder, it's then heated until the powder fuses onto the weight. Then it's rolled in a colored, in this case red, glass powder for the final outside color. Then the facets are cut, allowing us to look into the world within. This fabulous Italian Murano Museum piece in a swirled crown design with alternating rows of millefiori stacks situated between simmering, shimmering coppery adventuring ribbons. It is mid 20th century and it cost about $70.
sweetens orifores and costa make exciting contemporary paperweights. I was particularly enamored with this six-sided faceted cube sphere made in between 1958 and 1976 by one of two female Swedish designers, Mona Morales Schilt. There is a single perfectly centered bubble, trapped bubble, in brilliant clear glass crystal. And the optics cause double view as you turn it. I hope you can see that. As it comes to a corner, you see multiple bubbles. A skill that 1800s France beautifully perfected was lamp work, floral and fauna, encased in glass. Just like you've seen demonstrated at country fairs and art fairs, glowing liquid, semi-liquid, semi slightly cooled cup glass can be shaped and worked with rods and wooden shaping devices and repeated heating, forming and shaping glass into lizards, fish, butterflies, birds. Once completed for a paperweight design, the small components are melted together into a fragile assembly over a glass burner or torch and usually placed flat on the bottom of the weight. Again, the finished scene is reheated to prevent it from shattering the moment it comes into contact with the molten glass encasing it. You generally look at such a scene from above, but I'd like to point out to you that it is totally flat from, the, from, from a side view. Uh, Scotland has been a real hotbed of glass for a long time. This modern weight was made by a well-known Scottish artist, William Manson, and it shows African violets encircled by identical white cane millefiori with little blue stars in the center. This shows you the look of the flat lampwork of the late 1800s. And you'll note there's a little white signature cane with the artist's initials WM. This is about $60. This artist was trained by one Scottish artist named Paul who stands out from the crowd. There are two Pauls you're going to hear about. This one is Paul Esart, who was born in 1904 into a glassmaking family that immigrated to Scotland from Barcelona via France. He trained in Edinburgh, continued on at several different glass factories, leaving a trail of experts wherever he worked all over Scotland. He qualifies as the finest, most creative paperweight maker in history and father of modern paperweights. I am very fortunate to have a piece of his made between 1972 and 79. This fountain paperweight has six colored glass rods of latticinio twists joined in the center by a large bubble the glass canes curve up, out, and down and touch the ground. A small bubble is placed on the edge of each one by jabbing an instrument through the molten glass to make the bubble. This was $190. Because many glassmaking, so we're going to talk about it, you know, United States now, because many glassmaking immigrants settled on our East Coast, the American glass industry developed there in 1851. Glass companies and factories allowed enterprising paperweight makers the use of conventional factory equipment after hours. By about the 1940s, U.S. paperweight craftsmen developed their own styles, not so much following the European influence. 
These men formed a bridge between the antique and modern paperweights. 1951 saw the beginning of a paperweight renaissance when interest surfaced after almost 100 years of being out of fashion. Old glass techniques were applied in new directions, creating completely new, beautiful and unique spheres, magical worlds. Then let's jump to the early 1970s. By then, small artistic glass studios began and completely new, unique works of art glass, glass art, were created and refined. The California paperweight technique is the completely new, is a completely new torchwork technique. Glass painting on glowing hot glass. Taking the old iridescent Tiffany Art Nouveau and Art Deco painting style to a whole new level of elaborate surface decoration. By the way, you can watch that technique on YouTube. It's called, uh, it's by Orient and Froome, and it's called Drawing with Molten Glass on Molten Glass. Over and over again, using a constantly burning welding torch, these artists apply and melt new and different colored glass rods onto the red hot surface of a hot glass orb. They paint and shape designs, as you can see, delicately with pointed iron spike, pushing and pulling the colored glass on the surface liquid, shaping the motifs. By reheating again and again, the artist can keep the glass liquid for hours and paint like a painter, very slowly and carefully. When the desired design is achieved, the weight is encased in another layer of glass. Then a thin film of chemical is sprayed onto the glowing glass during cool down, achieving an iridescent, almost metallic effect, almost velvety, as you saw in the first weight that I showed you, which was this one. There are four notable California studios and some individuals producing, <laughs> producing these fabulous paperweights, including the Orient and Flume brand, of which I own these six. So I'm going to show, walk you through these. First of all, this is an Orient and Flume sticker that you'll find on the bottom of the paperweights. This it shows a, a five-petal white cane flower with a millefiori center, blue iridescent feathering, and a green stem. So you see the iridescent feathering and the millefiori center. Next is this green iridescent with blue and green vines and yellow hearts. This was about $175. This iridescent aqua with a four point design on the dome and feathering inside the designs. Next is a purple blue iridescent with little violets or dogwood and some white vines. That was about $75. And again comes my first one, my first love, my first paperweight. And you saw it earlier, and now you can appreciate it more knowing how the artist made those designs. The midnight blue background, sun feathering, iridescent purple flowers, green and white vine, and the millefiori centers on each of the flowers. My latest acquisition is this beauty, almost opaque, pink flowers with millefiori centers, green stems, and lots of feathering. That was $100. 
Last but certainly not least in this collection is this small iridescent blue-gray. I am not sure that this is Orient and Flume, but it fits into that ilk. There are independent artists who work in all the aforementioned techniques using Melifiori, flat lamp work designs, torch work to create flat as well as upright scenes. I will quickly go through the rest of my collection. This is Loretta Ely, an egg in a harlequin look design. Next is a rosy ribbed iridescent by Gibson. This was only $30. Next is a, an iridescent blue gold with webbing by orna Ornamental Blown Glass. It's from 1990 and costs about $35. Next is Saturn, an iridescent blue with swirls by Joel Bloomberg from about 1995. It was about $95. This gold iridescent has some light feathering and six poppy blossoms. It's by Vandermark in 1978. This large green iridescent four petal flower is called All Seasons by Glass House and it was made in 1988. Uh, on eBay, it goes for anywhere between $80 and $120. This is a simple purple-blue-green iridescent egg shape, about $50. I'm a Gemini, so these two small white iridescent with colorful confetti dots and swirls are made by glass eye. They're only about $35 a piece. But the ash is that makes these, that's in these, is from Mount St. Helens eruption in 1980. Next is a Canadian made egg shape by Robert Held. And it's green and white feathered swirls. And I think it's remarkable how accurately that all comes together. This next is just kind of a fun paperweight. I bought it for my husband because one time he had to be uh, Muka, the artist. So this is a Muka lady, lady holding fruit. It's an 1897 poster, Art Nouveau. So this is just a simple $27 <laughs> one that I got at a museum. The next three I'd like to show you are laser glass art, interglow, chrysanthemum, starfish, and shell. I think you can see why they're called interglow. Beautiful iridescence. And if you can't tell, iridescence is really my thing. <laughs> Next is the Livet Art Studio that made this pink and orange intaglio. This was about $49. This is by far my heaviest weight by Matem Studio Art Glass. It's triangular. You can hardly tell it unless you look at the bottom but it's a swirl in blue and purple iridescence with what are called oil spots. And it's signed by Irene Rudin. The next is an iridescent butterfly art paperweight by Robert Lehman. It's about $35. And lastly is this pink and white swirl with bubbles. Now, there is a category of 3D landscapes in paperweights featuring intricate lamp work again, similar to what you may have seen 
artists create animals and the like at the fair. I haven't been able to show you because I have yet to find one or two that I like that I can afford. <laughs> Here is a photo, uh, which we'll get in a little bit. Here's a photo of a desert scape. The lizard, rocks, cactus, plants are, of course, all glass. It looks equally good viewing from the top and the sides. There are beautiful underwater seascapes, mountain meadows, etc., that are pricey, around, starting around $500 on up to the thousands. My all-time favorite artist is another Paul, Paul Stankard. He is regarded as the finest paperweight lampwork artist of either the 19th or 20th century. His passion for nature was influenced by his childhood walks in the woods near his New Jersey home. He skipped other glass methods and instead set the standard in delicate lampwork technique where tweezers and other tools manipulate colored glass over a torch to create unbelievably realistic 3D botanically accurate glass flowers the stamens, the vein petals, leaves, stems, blossoms, complete plants with roots on the underside, twigs, moss, ants, bees, beetles, spiders, butterflies for his glass objects. From the book Beauty Beyond Nature, I'd like to show you his work. Some of his 8-inch orbs are too big and heavy to be handheld, so they are pedestal sculptures, an innovative form all his creation. He created glass columns to lift his botanically, botanical compositions out of the paperweight's squat dimensions into a perpendicular orientation. Patiently and with great skill, he produces scenes in upright form. Great ability is required to guarantee that the hours of prep of the many tiny details will not be damaged, twisted, or even destroyed while being melted into the optical glass blocks. Because of the complexity of making a paperweight in this way and the enormous amount of time required, only a very few can be created in a year. It is because his prices run up to $24,000 that I have only gorgeous photos of his work. You can see his uh, work demonstrated on uh, YouTube as well. Paul Stankard interpreting nature in glass at the Henry Ford Museum. It's a great watch. Stankard is also a poet, and I'd like to close with one of his poems, which he wrote of his work that you've just seen. Receive this glass. It holds my memories. Crafted blossoms suspended in stillness to be pollinated by your sight, anticipating your touch through time. Thank you for your interest in paperweights and your attention. <laughs>